Maps define us. Imaginary lines that delineate neighborhoods. They speak to where we've been and who we are. But these old boundaries only show part of the picture. Here are the new maps of Brooklyn. These are the maps that tell the story of Brooklyn today. And this is what it's like to live on the grid. Hi, I'm Zephyr Teachout and we are on the grid. Today, we are looking at nightlife in Brooklyn. I bet you've always wanted to know where the highest concentration of bars are, the highest concentration of liquor licenses are in Brooklyn. Well, that's what we're gonna find out. And to start, we're gonna talk with John Mollenkopf, the director of the Center for Urban Research at CUNY. In recent years, Brooklyn has been transformed by economic growth, infrastructure changes, and commercial and residential development. In some communities, a vibrant nightlife scene is emerging. In neighborhoods like Williamsburg and Red Hook that have higher concentrations of bars, we can see how nightlife culture is really reshaping the borough. Hello. Hey, wonderful Great to see, see you. you again. Welcome to the Brooklyn Ice House. So where are we here? The, so we're here in Red Hook. So what does this map show? These are the highest concentrations of of premises where people have uh, licenses from the state to sell alcohol for consumption at okay. the property. Okay, so th this is bars, roughly yeah. the highest concentration of bars in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. This map shows um, areas of concentration, but how different are these areas than the rest of Brooklyn in general? As you can see, they're all on the periphery of the city. They're in areas that don't have a huge amount of residential property. Yeah. They do have a lot of uh, industrial and commercial space. Mm -hmm. And so that means that uh, joints can be active late into the night. And yeah. that's one of the main reasons that their concentration is located in these places. Let's, let's start out where we are. Red Hook became gradually a, a place of interest because there was a lot of fairly empty or low rent space that artists, creative types moved in. Uh, there, there are new industries, there is a winery in Red Hook now, mm -hmm. uh, and on Van Brunt Street here, this gradually became a little bit of a commercial district for that sort of newly emerging population. Right. So. Now, let's talk about Williamsburg, mm -hmm. and uh, what's your sort of portrait of the Williamsburg liquor license bar um, establishment? So Williamsburg was always very much of a sort of blue collar ethnic neighborhood. So how did Williamsburg develop as this bar hotspot? Well, uh, a couple things happened beginning in the mid-80s. The first thing is that the subway system got fixed up. Mm -hmm. And then later on uh, into the 90s, the crime rate started to fall. Mm -hmm. So people, people began to venture to a lot of places that they wouldn't have before because they were somehow probably wrongly, but for some reason worried about how, how safe it was. And since the uh, L train goes from Manhattan over into Williamsburg in one quick stop over mm -hmm. the Williamsburg Bridge, people discovered, look, we can't afford the Lower East Side, let's just go one more stop and there's, there's Williamsburg. And gradually it started to fill up with, with young people and the young people drew you know, entrepreneurs to come in and start places where the hipsters would like to hang out. Okay. If you were to guess 20 years ago where you'd see the greatest density, would you have guessed Red Hook? No, because 20 years ago there was Sonny's and that was about it. There might have been one other bar mm -hmm. here. Sonny's was like the last uh, waterfront bar from the old days in Red Hook that somehow managed to hold on. Mm -hmm. And the person that owned it just was dedicated to keep it going, even if he only got two people in a night. Then gradually people started to find it and then more activities were started, readings, and uh, it just became a scene. In Brooklyn, there are more than 2,200 establishments with liquor and wine licenses. Red Hook and Carroll Gardens combined have over 111 bars and restaurants, which represents about 4% of Brooklyn's total. 86% of these locations received their license in the past 10 years, demonstrating the fast-paced growth and change in these neighborhoods. 
first, we're gonna make a stop at Sonny's. Established in 1895, this bar is one of the pioneering legends in Red Hook. We'll talk with Antonio Balzano, known as Sonny. He has spent many of his 81 years in this small neighborhood, Red Hook. Since he's been running the place, he's seen how his bar has gone from being the only game in town to the grand old man of an area packed with bars and restaurants. Let's go check in and see how he's doing. Hey there, handsome. <laughs> how are you? Good morning to you. <laughs> It's Zephyr. not what it is. It's is nighttime, isn't it? It's all over there. There you go. I, I've heard a story, maybe you know the truth of it, that toasting began because uh, people visiting from different fiefdoms wanted to make sure they weren't being poisoned. Yeah, I could see that's probably a valid story. It sounds right. Yeah, well, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. I I'm know not going to poison you. So. I, I was watching that. So. <laughs> Some of your coffees did fall into mine, by the way. Okay, good. You think I didn't see that, huh? I, I'm Do me sure a you kindness see for you to take this, empty it out, and give me a fresh one. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 I'm teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, uh, then, yeah. <laughs> so you've been here uh, in different times. Yeah. In, right here. Yes. And you've uh, seen uh, how people drink. <laughs> I know because I've seen myself. Okay. <laughs> but when you were a kid here, this uh, was a bar. Yes. Uh, 1945, what was this bar like? Oh my goodness. Well, in those days, um, so you had all the shipping on here. You see, this is before they had containers. Mm -hmm. All the ships were loaded and unloaded by hand. Mm -hmm. Crane. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the street, there was. Um, a gate that actually went from one side to the other. You had uh, customs that always there. And this was during the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. We had thousands of people that walked across the streets mm -hmm. in that whole area. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the, when the noontime whistle blew, mm -hmm. for folks to come out for lunch, then gates would open up. Mm -hmm. And really quite strange. Mm -hmm. And there was a restaurant on every corner. Mm -hmm. Every corner as far as the end of the neighborhood. In the morning, uh, How is the bar? What did it look like? What did it look like in 19, say, 42 or 1950? This bar. Do you know, it looks exactly the same. It does. It never has, it never has been changed. Um, and and uh, this bar was never really designed. It, uh, it uh, function was first, and then design followed. So that's mm -hmm. everything. All those bars, the two bars in there. They are the same as they were. The stove is the same stove that was there. My father was a chef here, mm -hmm. and uh, he did all the cooking on that stove. Mm -hmm. What was your father like? Oh, you'll love my dad. He was a sweetheart. Yeah. My father was Raphael. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we would, so we'd come home from school mm -hmm. for lunchtime, because we went to visitation, or PS30, which is down the street a ways, mm -hmm. and the visitation was up a little further by the church. So we would come here for lunch, and we can it was packed. It was, oh, we could hardly get in the door, mm -hmm. eh? But my son would come in, my father would make, some, make us a sandwich, mm -hmm. you know, so I could still taste that sandwich, you know. It was, what was it? It was like roast beef with gravy on it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, he, and he always packed plenty of food on it. Mm -hmm. And we'd come in every now and then, and my uncle would be giving us the sandwich, it was like one slice of <laughs> <laughs> I know, Uncle John, I love you, Guy, but to continue telling you stories about those little things. I, I, I'd keep you here all night. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Talking to Sonny, I'm not surprised that his place is still going. Standing the test of time, 120 years. This warm, welcoming, and unchanging mainstay has found ways to keep drawing people in. On our way out, looking at this beautiful sunset, I couldn't help myself. I had a question. I really came here to see if you'd be my running mate and we can run for I office would, yes, together. You, <laughs> oh, you got it, kid. You got it, absolutely. So I have to go out to see all the other stars of Brooklyn. Moving further into the night, my next stop will be Williamsburg, a neighborhood that over the last two decades has one of the most dynamic nightlife scenes in New York City. Just consider how quickly it's grown. 
Of the 275 restaurants and bars in Williamsburg, 239, or 89%, have received their liquor licenses in just the last 10 years, and the bars just keep coming. To learn more about how all this happened so quickly, I'll be asking BK Live TV host and self-proclaimed nightlife expert Aaron Watkins to give me some insight into what continues to draw people here. Hey! Hey! Yay! Here you are! So great oh, to gosh, see you. Hug. Good to see you. I, you know what I just learned? What's that? Is that you are not only an amazing host, but you are a... Williamsburg expert. Williamsburg expert. This is true. <laughs> it's true. We are in Williamsburg, and I want to tell you about a great little place. Here uh -huh. we are, South First in Bedford, uh -huh. and this is Videology. Mm -hmm. Now, this place has been around since about 2003. You know, a lot of places don't make it that long. Mm -hmm. When I first moved to Williamsburg, walking up and down in Bedford was one of my favorite places to be, mm -hmm. and this is one of the very first places that I fell into. So I want to hear about videology, but I also want to hear just like you're knowing this neighborhood and what's changed. You know, I mean, it's literally, it used to be that there were just a few bars here and there in Williamsburg and there's like art galleries here and there. And then all of a sudden, maybe 2004, 2005, there was just literally an explosion. I mean, there was mm -hmm. bars everywhere, loft parties all over the place. Yeah. Williamsburg actually became so convoluted that East Williamsburg and Bushwick area mm -hmm. started to get pushed out with the artists. Now you can see them far back into Ridgewood. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's a bar in every single corner in Bedford. I mean, so mm -hmm. I know some of the residents may not like that here. Yeah. That's honestly at this point sort of what you come here for. Yeah. From Kent Street to North 11th Street to South 11th. I mean, the entire strip you can see is nothing but a parade of cars, people right. every day. And it literally is just an amazing thing to see. Okay, so give me like five kinds of bars you're gonna find here in Williamsburg. Okay, five kinds of bars you're gonna find here in Williamsburg. Well, one, you're going to find your mega club. You're still gonna find your dive bar. You also have a lot of your fusion places. Okay. You know, places where that's like, it's a, not a lounge, it's not a club. Yeah. It's sort of casual yeah. lounge sort of places mm -hmm. that are very new and sort of, not saying necessarily space age, mm -hmm. but they're definitely not a dive bar yeah. and they're definitely not your mega club. Yeah. Then you have places, you know, like this. Mm -hmm. They're your cult, cult, cult culture places. You know, mm -hmm. this is by no means a dive bar, right. but it's a place where you can get something quirky, unexpected, and you really have to go onto the website because what you get on a Tuesday yeah. is not what you're gonna get on a Thursday. Yeah. And then after that, you have ethnic bars. Right. You have places that are still so ridiculously just throwback to another yeah. era. Back in the day when I used to throw parties, whatever, you had to get out flyers and promote right. and talk you know, to people I, on that. You know what? Internet I, changed everything. I actually, I actually used to go to raves. Yes, that's I, what I'm saying. But then in, how did the, you find out about the raves? In the early 90s, like 1990, It was a word of mouth. It was all word of mouth. It was all like, meet on this corner doing your at events, 6 to you had to meet on that corner. All right. <laughs> none of that is happening anymore. I promise you, none of that is happening. Yeah. Okay, I mean, just, I mean, nothing complicated. Yeah. But there's private groups. You know, like I said, you have to follow the DJs. You know, if you go to a club and you like the music, doesn't necessarily mean the next time you go to that club is gonna be the same type of music. Okay. You know, they have their Latino night, their salsa yeah. night, their gay night, their this yeah. night. So just because you like a place doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're gonna get the same experience if you mm -hmm. go back. Mm -hmm. So what you have to learn to do is you follow the DJs. Mm -hmm. Once you start to follow the DJs, you start to follow the promoters. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, then you start to follow the parties. Mm -hmm. And that's when you find out about the okay. different parties that are going on. I don't know how they find these places, uh -huh. but no sleep till Brooklyn. Zephyr. I bet my two favorite places when I, I stayed here for uh, just a couple months in between uh, two different apartments. Which, and, okay, which, okay, okay yeah. uh, Bembe. Yes, okay, yes, Bembe is still rocking. Yeah. Bembe is still rocking. Bembe is so a Bembe staple. Is a <laughs> Bembe is a staple. The thing I love about Bembe is it just, you know, that music sort of gets yes. you. You can't go everywhere and get that sort of music. Yeah. And it, they're literally there and, seven days and, a week. And, and, and they got good rum. You don't do rum when you're in Bembe? I, I, I do. <laughs> I mean, when you're rum. But I also love dancing in tiny places, which I do think this whole area is good for. I love Brooklyn. You know, working with, you know, Brick over the last couple of yeah. years and, and being able to focus mm -hmm. on the Williamsburg neighborhood and yeah. subsequently the um, Greenpoint and Bushwick neighborhoods. Yeah. I've seen just the amount of amazing, amazing growth that has happened here. It is 
mind-boggling. What I really love about videology mm -hmm. is that they were just a video rental place. And, you know, all of a sudden, Netflix and the audio streaming, the recession hit 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. and literally walking up and down the street, you're like, okay, when are they gonna not be around anymore? Yeah. And then next thing you know, they turn into like a really sleek, cool bar, renovated about 2012, and it's a great place to be. I, I mean, it sounds amazing, I'd love to go in. You know what, <laughs> it is an amazing place, and I'd love to buy you a drink. Sitting in videology with Aaron on a Tuesday night, his enthusiasm for this place and Williamsburg is contagious. With bars on every corner and people coming from all over the city, you can see why. And, as we're about to explore, that contagion has altered the very nature of this neighborhood. Today in Williamsburg, people identifying as white make up about 57.5% of this area's residents. By contrast, Although long rooted in this area, Hispanic populations are now moving out. Their numbers are decreasing and now they make up about 30% of the population. To get a better idea of the changes in the community, we're heading to Los Suras, AKA South Williamsburg, and making a stop at Eddie Jr's established in the mid eighties. This is just one of the many bars where for decades, salsa music and dancing could be found nightly. We'll meet Carmela Muzio, a sociologist who studies Puerto Rican life in Williamsburg and is also, it just so happens, an expert salsa dancer. She offers great insight into this place and promises to teach us some salsa moves to end our night. Hi, how you doing? Hey, how are you? How's it going? So nice to meet you. Welcome to Southside Williamsburg. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank well, you so much. Thanks Tell us coming. a little bit about salsa in Williamsburg. How long has Eddie Jr. been here? Uh, Eddie Jr has been here for longer than I've been alive, <laughs> for sure. And it's not actually a salsa bar, but they do play some excellent salsa music mm -hmm. inside. Um, the main thing about Eddie's that makes it stand out is it's one of the last uh, places of its kind that caters mm -hmm. to locals and caters to the local Puerto Rican community. So right now in, in this larger neighborhood, what is the current Puerto Rican um, bar scene like? Right now in this neighborhood, there's a couple of like cultural institution places like here. There's one Stronghold Puerto Rican Social Club that's still left running. That's a really old school spot. And there are a few, especially as you go into to East Williamsburg, there are a few Puerto Rican bars. There's Latin music playing, right? And there are newer Latin spots that have maybe salsa night, maybe Cuban food, things like that, which is great. But Williamsburg, despite having this strong history and ongoing cultural vibrancy, is in a very advanced stage of gentrification. I'm actually, I'm a sociologist, um, and although I have done some work on gentrification in Williamsburg, I'm currently studying salsa dancers in New York. I, I started doing the research after I was already a dancer, so it, it was something I was really passionate about, and then I start, started to look at it and see that there was a lot going on here, right? Did she wear the right shoes? Are we, are we, are we, does, does she wear the right shoes? She can make, soften I feel those, like we right? Can make She's that more worried about it. Like, oh, it it's not your shoes. It's that's not gonna the make shoes, it okay? So no excuses. <laughs> so, so um, if you could talk a little bit about the history here, you, you started yeah, to get absolutely. into, but in particular, the sort of history with the Puerto Rican community. With nightlife, I mean, if you, if you would notice, this is a little bit away from maybe like the main track of nightclubs and really trendy spots cool bars and all that which has taken off in Williamsburg and all of that is really interesting not to knock it um, but Eddie's is a little bit more a part of an older tradition um, a more local tradition and the main thing that I would say about it is that when yeah. I first started researching Williamsburg even as an undergraduate um, the news stories and the things that I could find in media looking at the way that the neighborhood is portrayed um, didn't resonate at all with my life or the lives of my friends that were living here. It was like I was reading about a different world, which in a lot of ways I was. Um, so the South Side um, has a really deep history, a really political history, um, and a strong history of community organizing, of like a cultural vibrancy that was cultivated here intentionally. Um, so there was a large group of Puerto Rican migration in the 1920s, um, an even bigger wave post World War II, um, industrialization, right? And that went all the way up to the 1990s. In that time period from maybe the mid-1950s uh, up through the 1990s, this neighborhood began 
a huge wave of changes, mm -hmm. right? So starting in the mid-1960s, this neighborhood was abandoned in a lot of ways by the city, disinvested, right? No public services, we're talking about bad housing conditions. This area had almost as many burned out buildings and lots as the South Bronx, which is famous at that time for the Bronx is burning, right? 1977. Um, so Southside Williamsburg, Williamsburg, Bushwick in general, all of Community District 1, which include, includes Breed Point and Williamsburg, um, had a huge issue with that, right? Arson, um, lack of services, poor educational facilities. And in the 1970s and the 1980s, community groups came together and organized around that. Mm -hmm. They took over buildings, they found people to fill the vacancies, they built really strong cultural institutions and organizations that are still here, like El Puente, Los Sures, yeah. in a way that really laid the foundation for big money interest to come in, real estate to come in. So you had, yes, a small artist community coming in in the 1980s, all the way by the river, some of the empty buildings, but what really took off is in the early 1990s, when real estate interests started to see that this was an area with great transportation, mm -hmm. uh, very accessible, a lot of space, a lot of loft space, um, they jumped into this, right? And it's not, people talk about gentrification as though it's just sort of something that happens, mm -hmm. right? The same way that segregation was talked about in a lot of ways, oh, well, people just like to live where they do, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not just an yeah. accidental process where people mm -hmm. move to other places. It was very intentional because there's a lot of profit to be made here. My dance company is inside, and they're actually the oldest salsa dance company in New York. And okay. they're called Santo Rico, which is oh. for Santo Domingo in Puerto Rico. I mean, you walk in, you take your first class, and it just captures you. I mean, it's a beautiful dance. Yeah. Uh, Beautiful to share that with a partner, right? Mm -hmm. I love partner dancing, beautiful movement, beautiful music. Also from New York, right? Yeah. Salsa as we know it birthed in El Barrio, mm -hmm. the Bronx, Brooklyn. Um, also New Yorkian, Puerto Rican neighborhoods. How would you connect, if at all, um, drinking and dancing? That's, it. That's an interesting question. I find that dancers in the salsa scene mm -hmm. hardly drink, but we spin a lot. Figure out how you're going to spin, either through drinking or through dancing. Right, exactly. <laughs> and actually, for that <laughs> reason, well, as the guy, uh -huh. as the guy, does does he think this does? Are the guys drinking or just the girls not drinking? Because the girls are getting spun, right? Yeah. So I can see how that could be a little, mm -hmm. little difficult. Yeah, but you guys, men lead, women follow. It's the number one rule. Fair enough. Just in this one thing. Right? Okay, don't <laughs> no, you said it. With that. Men lead. <laughs> can you say it? I heard just in this. Oh, one. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, when it comes to salsa, men lead okay. and women follow. You drink a lot and you knock me down. Uh -huh. I'm gonna go over to my friends and say, "Don't dance with him. He's terrible." I'd, I'd love to go in and try try to dance. Should we try it? Yeah, I'm definitely down to try. All right, let's go. Come and sprinkle to <laughs> All right, these are the Santo Rico dancers. Wow.
2,200 liquor and wine licenses in Brooklyn. We've only scratched the surface, but what an exciting night. Drinking and partying are as old as human existence, and here in Brooklyn, they're still causing change and growth. But it's good to see that some of the flavor of the past still lingers on.